right, we'd like to get started. <clears throat> My name is John Northrop. I'm moderating the uh, ethics panel discussion today, uh, titled uh, Mapping the Ethical Minefield. Our, uh, our panelists, uh, in the order in which they will be speaking, uh, answering the first question, are Scott Olmsted, right here, uh, David Friedman, and uh, David Bowes. I'll introduce each of them one at a time. Scott Olmsted is a member of the Central Committee of the Libertarian Party Radical Caucus. He's a member of the, he was a member of the 1981 National Platform Committee, and he is currently completing his PhD at Stanford University uh, in Engineering and Economic Systems. David Friedman is uh, at the Economics Department at UCLA. He's currently visiting uh, the Tulane Business School. He is the author of Machinery of Freedom and a Guide to Radical Capitalism, which he tells me is now available from laissez-faire books. I guess it's been out of print for a while and it's, it's currently available there. And he will be speaking tomorrow <clears throat> at the convention on what does a libertarian economist do. I can't wait to hear. <laughs> and then David Bowes is Vice President of the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. He was Research Director of the Clark for President campaign, uh, and he was Director of the Clark for Governor campaign. So those are our three panelists. We were to have Kent Guida uh, also with us today, but he has been called to a national uh, committee meeting, which has unfortunately been scheduled for the same time as this panel. If he, uh, I understand if he can get a break from that meeting and come down and join us for a while, uh, he will. So for the time being, anyway, there will only be three panelists. Uh, the way this is going to work is that I will pose an opening question and give each panelist, uh, say, four to five minutes to, uh, to answer the question. Uh, and then I will give each panelist an opportunity for rebuttal. Uh, and then after the round of rebuttal is completed, we will begin to take questions from the floor. Uh, in the absence of there being any questions from the floor, I have a few of my own. <laughs> And uh, I would ask that when you do ask questions, you keep them as brief as possible so that the answers can be as long as possible. After all, that's why we're here. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will end the rounds with uh, a round of summations from each one of the panelists. <clears throat> the first question that I would like to, uh, well, the purpose of this panel is to discuss the ethics of various proposed strategies for transition from whatever kind of society we may call the one in which we now live to what we might call a libertarian society. I have solicited questions in advance from these panelists, and I will be taking questions from the audience as well. But first, it would, I believe, be useful for us to get a flavor for the fundamental biases that each panelist brings to this discussion. So to that end, I will open the discussion with the following question. <clears throat> Can there be a conflict? Excuse me, between strategies which are effective and strategies which are pra uh, that is effective or practical, and strategies which are ethical or principled. In other words, can an ineffective strategy be principled? Can an unethical strategy be justified in terms of its effectiveness? Or is it always true that if a strategy is unethical, then it is not practical? and therefore there is no conflict. I didn't understand the question. <laughs> That's my fault. <laughs> Our first speaker is Scott Olmsted. Well, one of the things he told you is not correct. Um, I did not get to, to uh, submit any of these questions uh, in advance. And in fact, I was very recently coerced into being up here. So, uh, so uh, given uh, about 10 minutes to think about this, these are my opening comments. Uh, to me, the, the real question here is one of ethics versus efficacy. This is the way I first was introduced to libertarian ideas. Um, having been an econ, uh, econ major, studying economics, my... Um, first inclination was always to think about the efficacy or efficiency aspects of all sorts of things. And when someone finally pointed out to me that what ethics is about is about constraints 
by which you, which you might first rule out certain actions, um, and then you might take the allowable set and think about the effectiveness of those in, in pursuing whatever goal it is you have in mind. That was a bombshell to me. I never thought about things that way. So uh, when we think about, um, if we come up with an example of this, for example, might be lying. Okay, an individual might decide that his, his or her ethics rule out lying. Now, that doesn't mean that you might not possibly think all the time uh, when, when possibilities come up for um, achieving some goal of using, of lying to help accomplish that. And uh, this comes up all the time. Uh, I had to, to help try to bring someone to, uh, to a surprise party recently. Try to do that without lying to someone. Get them to a to a party. Okay. Um, so I think it's easy to construct a conflict between uh, the ethics and the efficacy of, of certain actions. Now the LP's goal, the goal of the Libertarian Party, is a little more complicated. It has an interesting twist to it, and that is that we are trying to bring other people to our ethical point of view. Okay. So it's sort of we're looking back on our own. Uh, ethics and when we consider the efficacy of doing that. Now, I could imagine that if no one, if it was, if we could be sure that no one would find out that the uh, National Committee could effectively uh, send out a team to rob a bank and use that to finance the ALP. But, of course, what is the point of that? You violated the, uh, the libertarian ethic itself and and what's worse is I can't imagine any sort of uh, strategy that included any, any significant amount of such violation of ethics ever um, being kept quiet enough to where the public wouldn't think we were being hypocritical. <laughs> so, uh, to put forth my bias, I guess, in this uh, uh, regard, uh, again, in general, I think it's possible to construct conflicts between uh, ethics and efficacy where you're trying to convert people to your ethics, um, I don't think there really is a conflict. You're going to have to stick with it if you're going to be effective in bringing that about. I think that there unfortunately can be conflicts between what is effective and what is ethical. Putting it differently, it may be that the way which is most likely to achieve my objectives involves doing things that I am not morally entitled to do, such as stealing from you. So that I think in principle that conflict does exist in the real world. The only sense in which I disagree with the question, as it were, as stated, is that it has the phrase uh, justified in terms of its efficacy. That is the question... Uh, can an unethical state strategy be justified in terms of its effectiveness? It can't be justified in terms of its effectiveness. If it's unethical, it's unethical. If something is immoral, that means you shouldn't do it. But it nonetheless may be the case that you will be morally obliged to give up the most effective strategy because it is a morally uh, forbidden thing for you to do because it involves violating people's rights. So I certainly do think that such conflicts can exist. Uh, obviously, one tries to reconcile them, one tries to figure out morally legitimate ways of achieving what one wants to achieve, and one may engage in very detailed and Jesuitical arguments in, in doing so, uh, but there ultimately is that conflict. Now, one thing I would like to say to those people who believe that there is some a priori reason why there can't be a conflict, and obviously there are uh, libertarian moral philosophers who think that they, they, as it were, have a proof that you can't have a conflict between what works and what is desirable, that people who believe this always use this belief to say, I've proved it's moral, therefore it must be practical. And they don't seem to see that the argument cuts both ways. If I prove that it's impractical, it must be immoral. All right, That all you've really demonstrated, if you, the moral philosopher, can prove that something is, is uh, moral, say, and I, the economist, can prove it's impractical. And if practical and moral are always the same, then one of us has made a mistake, but you don't know which one. You still have to refute whichever proof you believe is wrong. Now, I would like to sort of say, as a, as a closing comment related to this, 
uh, that there are two different issues I think this panel may have to deal with, having to do with the transition to a libertarian society. One of them is, as it were, the sort of tactical issue for the Libertarian Party, or for me as a speaker, of how we persuade people, how we end up getting elected or getting other people elected with our views. The other is the question, even if you were in a position of power, what would the appropriate things to do be to move from where we are now to where we want to be? And those are interrelated, but they're not the identical question. So that the place where I most clearly see a possible conflict between ethics and practicality is not in the problem of the Libertarian Party coming to power. I think I've got a sort of strategy for what the party ought to do that is both moral and effective. But assuming we get our ideas implemented, it seems to me quite likely that in the short run, we cannot defend North America from other hostile states without permitting things that we as libertarians object to, such as funding our defense with stolen money. Uh, and that, I think, is a very serious sort of practical moral problem. And when we have more time, doubtless we'll come back to it. I want to start by defining a term here, maybe a little more narrowly or maybe just more specifically than what's been done so far, I think. Um, in my discussion of whether a strategy can be ethical um, and effective at the same time or whether... Uh, there are times when it can't be. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian Movement stand for the principle that you should not initiate aggression against innocent people. We don't stand for, as a movement, as a philosophy, all the other principles that I think, as an individual, I should live up to. So, my definition of unethical or unprincipled in the context of the Libertarian Movement is, does it violate rights? Something that violates rights is unprincipled, it's unethical, and it shouldn't be done. Um, generally, I would say, uh, following that, um, once you decide whether an action or a strategy violates rights, um, that's the extent of, as a movement, the ethical question. Um, if it doesn't violate rights, then it becomes a strategic issue. Does it help us move toward liberty? I generally think lying to the public about what you want to do, uh, being racist, whatever other unethical thing somebody might do uh, that wouldn't technically violate rights, um, I think that would be ineffective in moving us toward liberty. But it's not the same thing as being uh, a rights violation. Okay, given that, I think there are some unethical actions, that is, actions that violate rights, that probably would help us move toward a free society. I can think of some of those. Um, and you shouldn't do them because they're wrong, because they violate rights. And even if it appears to put a severe uh, a crimp in your plans at some point in terms of moving closer to a free society, it would be wrong to do it. Um, however, I don't think that's true of strategies. Um, as was said here a minute ago, if you had a strategy based on robbing banks or killing people who stood in your way uh, or anything like that, um, that's clearly not going to help us move toward a free society uh, because people will realize that we are being hypocritical and because you're not going to have libertarians in a movement that does that sort of thing. Um, so I do think they're individual actions and I can't say that I've actually run into them but I can conceive of them um, where I think rights violations might help. Basically I think we ought to remember the point that, that I'm making is that the question is does a strategy violate rights. After that once you say it doesn't violate rights, the question becomes, does it help us move toward a free society? And there, I believe, we are only at the very beginning of devoting enough strategic thought to what libertarians need to do to move toward a free society. So I would urge us to focus a lot of attention in the next few months or years on moving beyond shouting allegations of principle and unethical at each other, when what we're really talking about is, I don't like the way something is done, um, and start discussing, does it help to achieve liberty? Before we go on to other questions, I'll give uh, each panelist an opportunity, which he may or may not take, uh, to address any other uh, items that the other panelists have brought up, uh, beginning with Scott. Is there anything you want to say? Yes. Okay. Uh, only that with regard to David's comment, some people would argue that fraud counts the same way force does. And if so, then lying about your views in order to get votes might arguably violate the libertarian principles. 
Do I get to rebut the rebuttal or only the previous statements? You, you, you have a lot of time. Okay, I have, I have no specific rebuttal of the earlier statements. I would just say in response to that, um, I don't think what I say to somebody else in order to convince him of my position or even to get votes is a contract, and therefore I don't think it's fraud. Um, if I tell you I like your new hairstyle, even though I'm lying, uh, that may or may not be a wrong thing to do, but I don't think it's broad. And I think the same thing is true in regard to votes. I see it's sort of like lying to the state, which I do think is permissible. Okay. <clears throat> I'll entertain some questions from the floor. Yes, sir, you had your hand up first. Uh, this is uh, mainly to, uh, to David. Um, I had to proceed by this very brief statement. Uh, personally, I would personally regard, and I don't know if most objectivists would regard rights as ethical primary, and regard them as a wide concept. Uh, I regard the basis of ethics as being rational self-interest, which a lot of people don't seem to discuss anymore. Uh, so my question would be a little different than asking you about rights. My question is this, if your ethics is based upon rational self-interest, and you consider this to be the proper basis for ethics, actually it's a two-part question, and I think that to be the proper basis uh, for ethics, um, so how can uh, something be practical in the world? It's the first part of the question. Second part of the question, I do regard rights as a proper basis for a legal code for a society. And if that's the proper, um, no, okay, no, the, <laughs> the, the answer is that if your ethical code really consists simply in uh, that behavior that maximizes your rational self-interest, then there can be no conflict between uh, what's ethical and practical. But that doesn't apply if on the way from rational self-interest to ethics, you introduce a whole lot of double talk about man qua man, and this and that, and, and why lifeboat situations are special. That is, all I'm saying is, if you take literally the idea that, that ethics are simply rational self-interest, then there is no conflict. But my impression, at least of a lot of objectivists I've argued with, and this may not apply to all of them or to the correct objectivist position, is that they end up with an ethical position which somehow in the distant past came out of rational self-interest but is by no means identical to doing what is in your rational self-interest. And at that point, there is then a possible conflict. But either other panelists... And of course, I am not an objectivist and I don't believe that ethics come out of rational self-interest. Do you want to comment? Yeah. Um, I guess my comment would be um, not having, never having been an objectivist, um, my view of sort of where the idea of ethics came from is that that there is a conflict between um, sort of short run and long run interest. In the short run, it may be to my interest to steal from my neighbors or whatever. And in, in the long run, however, um, it would generally be in my interest to have rules against such things. And uh, so, I don't know whether I'm adding much to what to what David said. Um, um, I just must admit that my thinking on where where this ethics comes comes from has still not. Um, solidified. I still have not heard a really good answer to, to tell me exactly where I should regard rights as coming from. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, to get to a concrete example, could each of the three panelists comment on, for example, the part campaign policy proposal for last presidential race, and in what ways they were impractical, and in what ways they were, if in any way, uh, I hope we'll begin with you. We'll rotate the order. I'm not sure I remember enough of the uh, policy proposals, but let me take the one which I looked at fairly carefully, which was the white paper on expenditure. And that was one where I would have said that, my view at least, is that for Clark to advocate this is both practical and morally legitimate. If he were president, however, you then run into a fairly serious problem. And that is that presumably on his principles, he has to pardon all tax resistors since they are acting morally. If all tax resistors are pardoned, the take from taxes is going to drop rather catastrophically, and he will then not have the revenue to fund the even the drastically reduced expenditures he wants. So that would give you an example, not of a conflict between moral and practical in the campaign. I should say my, I have a, a way of avoiding this very difficult problem, and that is that I don't intend to ever have a libertarian president, uh, <laughs> since, since my, my strategy for the Libertarian Party, as I've said before, is to imitate the successful strategy of the American Socialist Party. That is, to, to win, essentially, by getting enough votes so it pays the other parties to steal some of our ideas. And then our votes go down, and so we introduce some more and more radical ideas. And after a while, we convince more people of those. So our vote total goes up a bit, and then the parties steal those ideas. 
Uh, so that essentially my view would be that if we ever consistently get more than 10% of the vote, we've done something wrong. Uh, <laughs> and that therefore, we're not going to have the problem. And of course, those immoral Republican and Democratic presidents will have no scruples about collecting the taxes for the reduced level of expenditure we forced them to come out in favor of, and so forth. So, but that's only a sort of an ad hoc solution. That's a, a solution that keeps the problem from arising. But the question of what do you do if you somehow get elected president, it seems to me is a very serious uh, <laughs> problem. Are, are the American socialists happy with what they got from that strategy? I am certainly very unhappy with what they got, which is something <laughs> that they certainly, got a, they, they certainly got a large part of their platform. If, uh, if the Clark White papers were impractical, my experience was that it was because they were still perceived as two bonkers uh, by a lot of the rest of the world, um, despite some criticism within the libertarian movement that they weren't radical enough. Um, but sticking to the definition that I gave earlier, the question of whether they did or did not present a radical enough proposal is not a question of libertarian ethics, it's a question of strategy. Um, any other sort of white paper, um, whether it called for the abolition of taxation, a 10% income tax cut, um, a property tax cut, or whatever, the question is, which of those will help us move closer to a free society? Uh, and there are trade-offs involved. You offer a more radical perspective, um, you'll get some people who are looking for a sweet and radical perspective. You offer a more moderate position, you can get more people to say, gee, the libertarians are on something I should read more about. And I think you have to make sort of trade-off there. Um, so I think they were uh, as ethical and as practical as could have been put together in that situation. It's a little off the subject, but my perspective on the American Socialist Party analogy is that um, I don't think the American Socialist Party are happy with what they got, and I think I would be equally unhappy um, as a solid libertarian um, with what we would get in following this strategy. Ultimately. While I think they will do some of the things, I, I think some of the parties, the, the party, the major parties will accept some of our ideas and maybe even implement them, although we found bravely that a lot of our writers didn't implement very many of the ideas. Even if they did, um, ultimately there are a lot of linchpins of state control over people, and I don't think the other parties will dismantle those. And that's why, difficult as those problems will be to face someday, um, I think the challenge for us is to be willing to face the problem. I guess my main complaint about the Clark campaign was um, what he what he sort of what Clark said was really a, a uh, uh, his idea was to campaign on a smorgasbord of issues, okay, and try to get um, put together a constituency, each of which was paying attention to its own issue that the Libertarian Party was saying the right thing to them about. And it uh, um, seems to me like like there's a, uh, a large number of people out there who, who are still waiting to hear the overall message, okay, and to see things tied together. Um, I disagree with uh, David Friedman that if we ever get more than 10% we're doing something wrong. I think that, that uh, if we manage to get more than 10% and we manage to stay radical and principled and not and further away our, our basic platform, uh, then we're doing something right because we're getting across the message that the other parties are not to be trusted. Okay, that's that, that's key. Um, um, I think I'll let it go with that. David Freeman. Yeah, asked I just wanted something. two very brief comments. One of them on that, the reason I don't want us to get more than 10% of the vote is if we start getting more than 10% of the vote, we're going to stop being principled because people will find that being powerful in the Libertarian Party is a way of getting income, power, prestige, and so forth, and those professionals will beat us amateurs. So that my argument is essentially an argument about the internal dynamic of the party, that as long as it's reasonably small, it's going to be dominated by ide ideological forces which will keep it on the straight and narrow path, and when it's large, it'll turn into another Republican Party. I respectfully the, disagree. These are the, the Socialist Party. The reason the Socialists don't like what they got isn't that they didn't get what they want is that they didn't like it once they got it, because socialism doesn't work. <laughs> they, sure, they wanted, univer they wanted universal public education, but they didn't like what the public schools turned into. They wouldn't have liked it if they had put it in by winning the election either. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions from the floor? Yes. Uh, how much did the voters in the request for 
regard to what you said before, I do. Uh, uh, you mentioned we should stop yelling at each other, saying that we're moral, and consider the primacy of are we advancing for those others. Uh, excuse me, liberty. Um, liberty. Like, <laughs> literature is a <laughs> I'd like to go beyond that. One of the things that, that has been a concern of mine in watching the movement grow over the last 10 years is the abysmal way we're treating each other in general. And, I don't want to live in a free society if along the way we've forgotten to treat each other as decent human beings. And I see that happening too much within the movement today. Uh, and so, I'd also, just briefly to my question for comment, Rosalie Nichols, uh, a sometimes activist in the movement and author, uh, was once quoted as saying that every rights violation is an injustice, but not every injustice is a rights violation. Uh, definitely, we as libertarians are concerned with those injustices which are rights violations, but I think that perhaps one of the problems we have had in advancing ourselves as a movement is an apparent lack of concern with, with injustice, which is not specifically related to rights. And I invite comments from all of you. Um, I think one of the problems is that we sometimes use words that do have two different meanings, like injustice. I mean, I would sort of prefer, as a libertarian here at the convention, to discuss political philosophy to say that justice basically is uh, the implementation of uh, a system that respects rights. But I'm not saying that there aren't other things that are colloquially injustices. Um, and I guess you're saying that libertarians, qua libertarians, um, ought to show a concern for those other things. Um, I think to some extent that confuses the message um, and it gives us a, um, it tells some people who are not doing anything or thinking <coughs> about a libertarian that there's something wrong with them. And I would find that that would put some people off. Basically, however, again, I think it's a strategic question. Um, would it be better uh, to be a party that um, puts a lot of emphasis in going out and helping the poor individually? Um, it's, an, it's better, is the case generally, an injustice done by the government. And we're against that. But ought we to show our concern by taking baskets of food and helping the poor find jobs and things like that? Um, I think it's a strategic question. Is that a good use of resources for libertarians? It's a good thing for people to do. Is it a good use of libertarian resources? Um, and I guess I incline toward the position that our limited resources ought to be put toward specifically um, advancing our ideas and getting organized, and getting on ballots, and doing all the things that we think advance liberty. And that we ought to have a general image of being concerned about injustice in a broad sense but we shouldn't be tying specific problems to libertarianism. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the woman who asked the question is June Jenis, who um, I, I owe a great debt to. I learned a great deal from at Stanford, uh, working with her and Stanford Libertarians and other projects. Um, she asked a really good question about how we, how do we talk to each other about our differences? And... Um, now, I'm associated with a group that um, often gets, uh, maybe justifiably so, uh, uh, called uh, dirty names because of the way it uh, uh, treats the differences among us. Uh, my personal role has been to try to make this um, a, uh, a contest where everyone uh, punches, a, you know, doesn't punch below the belt, keeps their gloves on, whatever. Um, I was the one who created... Um, the uh, brickbats, brickbats and bouquets column in Libertarian Vanguard. I wanted a way, a language, which we could say to people, you know, we 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 still love you, but we think you're wrong on this, okay? And then we you can you can talk about it. And it's interesting. It's interesting. I was told I wasn't there. I was told at the um, at the platform that at the platform meeting in Texas in um, May or June, whenever it was, that uh, uh, that this was this was uh, used in the in the debate, okay? Uh, People would put forth an argument uh, this, on this plank, whatever, and someone else would say, "No, I give you a brick bat for that." You know, I think it's, I think it's this. Okay, this is a way that that, that we can talk to each other about our differences, and uh, maybe it's been successful, maybe it's not. I'd love to uh, to get your comments on such a thing. Extraordinary as it may seem, I believe I agree with both of the previous speakers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in the habit of agreeing with anybody. But I think I would summarize David's comment 
from my standpoint, is saying that I'm an economist. And as an economist, of course, I believe in the principle of division of labor. And that in terms of division of labor, the function of the Libertarian Party is not to spread general morality, light, food for the poor, and so forth, but to spread libertarianism. At the same time, I also believe that as individuals, there are certain ways we should behave. And although I do not believe that I can deduce ethics from rational self-interest, I nonetheless believe there is a very large overlap between the two. And that on the one hand, I think I ought to be a reasonably honest, uh, kind, gentle person. And on the other hand, I also believe that if the Libertarian Party is made up of reasonably honest, kind, gentle people, it will probably work better and be more effective than if it isn't. So that in that sense, I agree with what Scott said. Uh, I think that we ought, as individuals, to try to behave decently, uh, and that that will help uh, achieve our goals. Uh, a plug for my personal hero in this department, who's George Orwell, uh, that I think a lot of what is important in making a political movement work is being willing to be honest about where the holes are in your own argument, honest about where your side may be wrong or was proved wrong last week, uh, or maybe you still think it's right, but not as right as you thought it was, and so forth. And I think that we could use a great deal uh, more of that. Uh, one of the things that struck me at the, in, the, in the Middle Eastern uh, panel was the tendency of people who want to be in favor of Israel to then simply sort of blank out the anti-Israeli half of the evidence, and people who want to be in favor of the Palestinians to blank out the anti-Palestinian half, that sort of you had one person saying, in effect, all of the Palestinians who left Israel at the time of the 48 war did so because they were driven out by Israeli terrorists. And on the other hand, you had the other person saying, in effect, all of them left because the Arab state said, get out of the way so we can invade and kill all the Jews. Both events happened, and it seems to me eminently plausible that some people left for one reason, some for another, some for both, and some for neither. And yet there's a strong tendency not to be willing to admit that because it makes it so hard to have a tidy, pure argument. <laughs> From time to time, as they request, I will give the panelists an opportunity to ask uh, other panelists questions. And Scott Olmsted has one. This seems to me the one that the, that's right in the middle of the ethical minefield. Okay, and that's thinking about proposals to change the way taxes are collected or, or the tax rates or whatever. And it's particularly relevant perhaps in the flat tax question. And that is, is the, um, if you have a proposal to change the tax structure somehow and it raises one person's tax, at least one person's tax, uh, the overall tax they pay to the government, is it immoral? Okay, is it unethical? Should libertarians oppose it? I don't have a good answer, so I'd like to hear the other panelists. Let me give you, it suddenly struck me that there's an interesting and non-obvious analogy. It is arguable that if I put a good lock on my door, the result will be to increase the number of crimes against other people. Because the burglar will come to my house, and they'll say, I can't break in there, I'll go to the next house down. And yet it seems to me hard to say that on those grounds it's immoral to put a lock on my door. So that my initial instinct, without thinking about it a great deal, uh, I mean, I've thought about the question, should we advocate changes? But if you put it in terms of anybody's tax goes up, and my initial instinct is that in some sense, if I'm not entitled to collect the taxes, I'm not entitled to force you to pay a tax, but if by voting for politician A instead of politician B, I can get what I regard as a generally less oppressive tax system, oppressing me less and oppressing most other people less, seems to be legitimate to do so, even though, unfortunately, one consequence is that there are going to be a few people who are going to end up getting oppressed more. And it seems to me that's close to analogous to the lock on my door, although it's a somewhat complicated analogy. It's not exactly identical. I think the flat rate tax is a difficult question, and it does bring up uh, some good questions about what sorts of policy proposals is appropriate for libertarians to make. It's one thing to say uh, that it's clearly sensible to propose a tax cut that doesn't abolish taxes, but cuts taxes. The flat rate tax probably would make some people's taxes go up and other people's go down, and a lot of it depends on where you set the rate, um, what you mean by a flat tax. Um, in Washington, what they frequently mean by a flat tax is not lower rates or anything, but broadening the tax base. Everything you currently get that isn't subject to taxation would be brought in. Um, their perspective is certainly not that taxes would end up being lowered. 
On the other hand, from an economic standpoint, it certainly would be a tremendous boon for the economy to have marginal rates uh, of no more than 19%. Even if the overall uh, tax rate wasn't changed, if the overall burden of government on society, um, and some proposals might even be less than 19%, I am inclined as a libertarian to say it would be wrong to implement a proposal that would raise one person's taxes and lower everyone else's. But I'm not comfortable with that conclusion. Um, if I were president and I knew, and, and, and a bill had been passed and my signature uh, would determine whether this bill became law and it would raise one person's taxes and lower everyone else's, would I really refuse to sign that law? Would I really veto that? Would I put myself in the position of making 220 million people pay more taxes and one person not pay more? Um, I'm not comfortable with coming to the conclusion that I wouldn't do that, um, but I can't say at this point that I would endorse a plan that would increase somebody's tax. I have the answer for you, David. You sign it and then you pardon the person whose taxes went up. <laughs> That's a very good idea. I would probably do that, despite uh, having been reported in print recently as having said that a libertarian uh, administration would hunt down tax evaders. Um, I think I probably wouldn't, and I think uh, that would be a good proposal. I think, however, it's uh, it's a little off the point. I mean, uh, you don't always get the opportunity to do that, so it doesn't really change, I think, the strategic dilemma you find yourself in. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that Clark campaign did was to buy some television time and greatly reduce rates because of a government law that requires them to offer this time. This was clearly taking some property rights away from the television stations who sold the time at less than its commercial value. On the other hand, it was the most effective means of communication that the party had. Was it unethical? <coughs> was it effective? And what will we do in 84? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I don't think it's going to be a problem in 84, frankly. Um, <laughs> but uh, if we had this opportunity, um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult question, I agree. Um, and you have to know a lot about the way the FCC works in order to answer it properly. Um, you have to determine what would have happened in a free market and how close we are to a free market and what we can do in a system where we're not in a free market. Um, Clark also drove on government roads at greatly reduced rates from what they would have been um, <laughs> had there been a free market in roads. I clearly don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, Clark used the, um, the non-profit postage rate um, at presumably lower rates than a free market would have, although that one I don't think is clear at all. Um, yeah. Might very well be lower rates, but lower than anybody else could get. Um, so we were taking advantage of something there. Um, on the other hand, there were services we paid more for because there's no government because there's government intervention. Maybe not airlines in this campaign, but certainly in previous campaigns, our candidates paid more to fly on airplanes because the government regulated the airlines. Um, I would say when the networks uh, announce reluctantly, um, but they do announce this time is available. In a, in effect, what you had there was that the networks made a deal with the FCC. You keep the other networks out of business, and politicians get cheap airtime. Now, that's not a good deal, but if they're going to offer it to Democrats and Republicans, I think they have to offer us the same deal, just like the post office. Um, and so I think that we should have bought all the time we could get, um, $25,000 to reach 20 million Americans at one time. It's clearly the best use of money you can get. And I think given the situation we found ourselves in, um, it was not unethical to accept the same terms that the networks offered other parties. Scott. Well, I guess... When I think about this one, I also think about, I, I, I try to keep in mind at the same time the question of would we accept um, the government subsidies to, uh, to the presidential candidates or races or whatever it is, uh, were we to be able to qualify for them? And uh, it seems to me that so far libertarians have been almost unanimous in rejecting those. And then the question is, do, do, does this subsidy or, or does this um, uh, cheaper airtime fall in the same category? Um, I'm inclined to first ask the question, what will happen if we say no? Okay, will, will the other parties get it? And if, if that's, uh, it was my understanding, I think that that was the case, that there was a fixed amount of time and, and you were allocated so much, but if you didn't use it, some of the others got it. I could be wrong on that. So it seems to me, it seems to me that in that case, 
I'm inclined to say it's okay to take it uh, for the same reason as driving on government roads. Now, why doesn't that argument apply to the uh, to the um, direct subsidy of money from the from the government? Well, maybe it does. Um, if I sound wishy-washy on this, it's because uh, it's, it's this is this is really in the middle of this minefield. Um, I would think that that the uh, the first thing we'd want to do if we ever did. I'm not saying we should, but if we ever did decide to take the government subsidies, is find some way to first offer it back to to taxpayers. Um, I'm not advocating that we that we do that, but it might be a hell of a way to uh, to make a statement if we ever decided to go in that direction. Um, I guess I'll I'll leave it at that. My gut reaction is that it was unethical. Uh, I'm not sure that's right. I believe about three quarters of David's arguments are wrong, but I'm not sure about the other quarter. Uh, in particular, it seems to me talking about, well, our candidate paid more for this and less for that is a little bit like saying that because someone else stole $50 from me, I'm entitled to steal $30 from you. That seems to me it's quite irrelevant. Uh, similarly, with regard to the post office, I don't think that's relevant. I think there is a legitimate question uh, of along the lines when he says there's been a deal made by the, uh, radio, the, the radio station for the FCC. And I think that the distinction Scott is making is close to the distinction I'm inclined to make. It seems to me if I take an action which results in the government using force to take money from you and give it to me, that there is a pretty clear case that I have aggressed against you. If I know the government is taking a whole lot of money from people and I take actions which make sure that I get some of it, then it seems to me question, that, that I haven't aggressed against you. In a sense, that's driving on the public roads, getting the benefit of some of the money the government's going to steal anyway. And when I say my gut reaction is that we shouldn't have, my gut reaction is that what was happening was asking the government to force an essentially private firm to sell something below its market value. And if that's what was happening, it seems to me we shouldn't. And I don't think it's enough to say, well, the networks are hand in glove with the FCC, because although there's some truth to that, nonetheless... If anybody wants to run a television station at the moment, they have got to be hand in glove with the FCC. Otherwise, they put them in jail. So that it's a little bit unfair to say, we can steal from you because you're dealing with the government. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Manny's uh, line in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Uh, Do business with the authority. Do business with the law of gravity, too. Uh, yes, Jim? The point of their being, of course, is that the, uh, the, money, the, the money that is won is going to come out of the hide of the taxpayers. I know uh, libertarians have frequently talked about suing the government for one thing or the other, the Freedom of Information Act, or interest, but it's not breaking the law. Uh, the other people in the government who pay those bills. So I thought this one think about that. This is not just an academic question, since um, the bookstore run by the San Francisco party and the, the Radical Caucus was you know, broken into and broken up by the San Francisco police a couple of years ago, and the party there um, brought a suit against the city of San Francisco uh, with the ACLU, basically, uh, uh, well, I really can't tell you uh, much details about the suit itself. Um, but it looks like uh, probably we're going to collect some money in an out-of-court settlement sort of thing so to keep it from our, if, if, and so it won't go to trial. The, uh, our prospects for actually taking it to trial and winning um, would be a lot better except that uh, the pretext which they used for um, busting up the bookstore, that there was drug sales uh, in the bookstore, um, they did find some people with drugs in the bookstore. That's a fact. So, so it makes our side makes our side look really bad. Whether it happened the way they said it did um, is, is another question entirely. Um, it, it gives the people who might receive that that money. It's not going to be very much, I understand. Um, a real dilemma. Okay, do we offer it back to the taxpayer somehow first? You know, pro rata share. You know, come and get your two cents, or 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 what do we do? Um, I, again, I don't have a real good answer for this. I would like to see some way, first, of offering it 
offering it back to, to taxpayers somehow before we decided to uh, keep the rest of it or to say that any taxpayer who didn't come and collect his pro rata share um, is authorizing it for use against the state in some, some fashion. Um, a related question is um, what's come up in California. I heard talk of a possible initiative um, last year sometime of something called a just compensation initiative. Okay, The idea being that government, whenever it um, did any one financial harm, decrease the value of their property due to rent control or just confiscated it outright or whatever, would have to pay, pay a, a roughly a market value for this. Okay, Now on the face of it, a libertarian might say, well, gee, that's going to be more taxes for more people uh, uh, to pay for these things that the government is seizing or controlling. But uh, I'm, I'm inclined to favor such uh, an initiative be simply because it will ex tie the hand of government uh, much tighter than it's currently tied. Now they can seize things or, or control them without any any feedback at all, any controlling mechanism at all, whereas if they, they uh, had this, especially in the light of Prop 13 and the tight budgets in California, there would be just no way that they would be able to control uh, nearly the uh, uh, amount of, of property that they do. Um, maybe uh, some of the other panelists would like to comment on, on that issue as well. <coughs> I think my inclination is to say that if I sue the government and vote against all tax increases, I am at least doing the best I can to make sure that the money that gets paid to me comes out of expenditure, not out of income. Now, it's a little bit tricky. I suppose if it were really my professional opinion that the effect of suing was mainly to make uh, taxes go up, I would be reluctant to do it. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, after all, you could argue that uh, when you shoot the guy who's trying to rob your house and he then gets away, uh, that imposes high medical bills on him, so he's got to get a little bit more active in his business and rob three more houses uh, as a result, and yet it doesn't seem to be a sufficient reason against, against injuring him. So I guess, sort of, again, my gut reaction is, yes, you can sue the government, uh, and yes, you can get money from government in any way you plausibly can, as long as, in the process, you do your best to avoid uh, encouraging higher taxes. So that's sort of my policy in the past. At the moment, I'm at a private university. But my policy at various points in the past when I was at a public university was to refuse to sign the petitions that circulated to the legislature telling them that they ought to have more taxes to give the state university more money, to tell anybody who asked that I thought they'd have less taxes and give the state university less money, but nonetheless to collect my salary. And that seems to me is equivalent. <laughs> is equivalent to being willing to sue them. I have a sneaking feeling that a lot of people would get rid of that if they were accepting cash payments from the government or supporting a law that would give payments to people, but perhaps I'm wrong. Um, the real question, it seems to me, we have to ask in response to the question, and this deals with the question of whether we would accept subsidies if we ever got 5% of the vote after an election, is how does the government get its money and how much does it get? Does government get all it needs? Um, the, the legislators get together and they add up and they say, well, we need this much for Social Security and this much for education and we got to pay this much for that suit and uh, we took three people's rights away and so we have to pay that and then they send us a bill. I don't think so. Um, I think uh, public choice and class analysis and all those sorts of things are generally correct when they lead us to the conclusion that the government takes all it can get, and then it allocates it. And so if, uh, if you have a government job, that simply means that some other economist is not getting that salary. I don't think it means the taxpayers of California are paying more. It may even mean that some OSHA agent isn't getting his salary in some balancing act. Um, at the same time, um, you know, should we take the government subsidies? Well, I'd be inclined against it, and there are good strategic reasons not to take it. But on the other hand, if the government, uh, I, I also understand, uh, just as an aside from election lawyers, that there is no way to take the money and give it back to the taxpayers in any sort of way. That would be buying votes with government money, which supposedly is illegal. Um, <laughs> in any case, if, if, the, if the choice is we take it and we use it to advance the Libertarian Party, or we don't take it, and you come to the conclusion that the government is going to spend all it can steal, then 
By taking it, maybe we prevent them from building another MX missile or opening another OSHA regional office. And uh, would I not take it if I thought that was the uh, <coughs> impact of our decision? Uh, I think in that case, we might want to think about it. Um, it's not a clear case. There are strategic reasons not to do it. I, certainly the TV value of burning the check on the steps of the Capitol um, has something going for it. But if it's going back into a treasury that's going to be used to do things, most of which are worse than giving us money, I'm not sure it's clear. Just a, a brief comment. I agree with David that um, basically on the theory that government takes all it can get and then allocates it. I think that supports um, a, a just compensation uh, Measure simply because it would it would uh, mean that they're going to have to allocate some of that to to uh, paying off the people whom their property they're taking, and uh, so not only would less property be taken, but uh, someone might be compensated for what is taken. I just wanted to say first, I think it very unlikely that either a model in which there is a fixed amount they can take independent of everything else and they take all they can, or a model in the other direction can be correct, that my current area of professional research is the question of what determines how much money governments spend, and I'll talk more about that in my talk tomorrow. Um, building on both of those points, I would say um, what government can take, obviously, uh, is a subjective factor. And so my inclination would be to say a just compensation measure would be the sort of thing that would be used to justify publicly um, why we needed increased taxes. It's the same thing with uh, um, if you get on food stamps or something. Are you just taking money that would have gone to somebody else? Maybe so in the static model. But in a dynamic model, they're going to go into Congress and say there were 400,000 more applications for food stamps last month. So to the extent you contribute to that, you influence public opinion in the direction of letting them steal more. So you have to weigh those considerations in your model. Okay. Uh, in the back. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I wonder if all three panelists can comment on certain transition proposals for Social Security, which might, at least as I understand it, certain proposals involve temporary increases in payroll taxes, at least in the short run. The that. question is, transitional proposals towards ending Social Security, which involve temporary payroll tax increases, whether those increases are, or whether, that, whether those proposals are ethical? Uh, the order now starts. I think it most unlikely that any such proposal would be prudential, would be desirable, since I would say the clearest uh, sort of casual empirical observation about taxes is that once they go up, they don't go down. Uh, so therefore I would be opposed to that. If you're asking, is there any conceivable case in which some transition which involved increasing some tax would be desirable? I suppose the answer is yes, but I think it's quite unlikely as a practical matter uh, that a, anything which simply increased one tax and didn't lower some other tax would, would, would be a good idea. Most um, I'm not aware of any current proposal that would have as part of it increasing payroll taxes. Um, the Ferrara proposal, which uh, the Clark campaign supported, um, could be used that way. Clearly, it's not what uh, Ferrara and Clark and the Cato Institute and other libertarians who have supported it have in mind. What we have in mind is that, actually, in terms of specific payroll taxes, it abolishes payroll taxes the first day it's implemented, uh, unless you do it on a phased scale, but it, it would lower them. Um, but what it would do is... Um, shift some spending to general revenues. Now, our the way we present the program is then you cut other spending in order to do this. Um, uh, Milton Friedman has always, or, or at least has said in the past, I certainly want to be very careful. I'm sure there's a better expert on his thinking here. Um, but my understanding is he has said in the past opening Social Security up to general revenues would be a great way to squeeze off every other government program. Social Security would just eat up all the general revenues. Um, strategically, there's something to be said for that. Um, to the extent that we come up with a proposal that has the potential to be used that way, um, I think the likelihood is that um, they're not going to get significant increases in general revenue taxes or payroll taxes on this basis. It would squeeze out something else. Our candidate is you bring the troops home from NATO, and that'll fund your transition program to end Social Security. Um, but there are certainly other uh, proposals that are viable. I would think it would be a bad idea 
both from an ethical and a practical standpoint, to increase payroll taxes. Just as a general point to apply my opening statement, um, what is the most radical Social Security reform proposal? Is it um, cut everyone off today, as I've heard some libertarians suggest? Is it cut off all the, everyone who has collected more than they put in, which is to say basically anybody over 68 or 69, because it didn't take long to collect at this point what you put in. Um, is it the Ferrara plan? Is it something else? To my mind, given that we don't increase taxes in implementing any of these plans, but the question is how fast we phase them out, the question is which program would get rid of Social Security the fastest. Um, and I'm willing to have my mind change, but my impression is that the Ferrara plan is the most likely alternative to get Social Security abolished, and therefore it's the most radical Social Security reform plan. Not sure I would equate how radical something is with, with how likely it is to, uh, to accomplish it in, in the short run. But to speak to the, uh, uh, Danny's question about, I certainly would oppose anything that had a temporary payroll tax increase in it. Uh, I oppose transferring uh, Social Security to general fund, to any sort of funding from general revenue, uh, I think it's um, uh, the, the moral case, uh, I think, is, a, is maybe can be made against it. To me, the income tax is by far the most objectionable tax, since it means you've got to lay your whole life before the government, and, and they come after you with, uh, with guns and, and, and you know, take your, car, take your car or whatever. Um, and I think the ultimate... Uh, uh, result of transferring it to that would be uh, some sort of increase in income taxes. So uh, I also like to see see people see the individual taxes for the things that they're paying for, and that line on their paycheck that says, you know, ooh, there went another bite to to this this program, which is you know goes uh, is going broke every five years or so, uh, is a good thing. It's a good feedback mechanism to have to to order, to um, to rally people against that particular system. And I, I would not like to take that away. Um, I'm not sure what prevailing ethics uh, we necessarily have in the United States. There are a lot of elements of individualism in the United States, uh, general ethic. Most people are pretty inconsistent about a lot of things, uh, at least when they talk about what they think. Uh, when they act in their own behalf, they seem to be able to... Um, understand their own needs and desires uh, fairly well. Um, I think we can challenge the control that the state exercises over people more directly than that, um, and challenging altruism specifically does not seem like a good idea to me. And I'm not opposed to it as um, philosophers doing that and that sort of thing, but it seems to me altruism is not ultimately the enemy. Um, mostly uh, the enemy is people not being uh, sufficiently supportive of individual rights, and that has to be challenged. But I don't think people generally um, make exceptions to individual rights on the basis of altruism. I also think you have to challenge very directly the concept that any of these altruistic government programs ever have the effect that's brought about. And I think that will be a lot more effective in changing people's minds about them. Um, to say... Um, we ought not to use government to help the poor, I think will be less effective than to say government doesn't help the poor. Um, and if we can demonstrate that, I think we'll be more effective. No, I, I basically agree. I, um, rather than challenging altruism, I would like to see us harness it. Um, it seems like that what we ought to challenge is the notion that government equals altruism. Um, the question that... Uh, um, my advisor at Stanford, the first one who introduced me to libertarianism, always puts it to people is, is what, what is real help to the disadvantaged? Okay, is it a government program of whatever type? And uh, I'm in favor of making people think about that question real hard. And I think we can do that. Both of the previous speakers, I think, just endorsed the position I've been arguing for for the past 15 years. Uh, 
I, I should say, I am not at all sure we can get a libertarian society in any way. I hope we can, but I'm not sure we can. But I think if we can, I suspect we can do it with more or less the same incoherent mix of moral views the population now has. <laughs> mechanism of government may not be a, a good libertarian position, um, that making tax in some way fairer, uh, at least for a while, legitimizes it um, and, and tends to make it harder to evade for those willing to put in the work to evade it. Um, I, I'd like to hear some comment on, on this, in the general case of, of making government work nicer, is that a good idea? I'm not sure whether you're asking the question, which is sometimes raised, of uh, uh, what might be called or put forward as, as the worse the better theory. Okay, the idea that that uh, what we really want to do is really make, really see government make a real mess of things. Then we can come charging in as the white knights. So uh, so when government really makes, when government imposes price controls, that's good for our cause because now people are going to learn how bad price controls are. I kind of think. Um, I was in, very early. I was initially sort of an advocate of that. That that appealed to me, but I guess I've uh, hopefully rationally tossed that off. I, I I don't subscribe to the worst of better theories anymore. I think what we have to really look at is real gains for liberty rather than potential we think might be gains in these awful situations that that government creates. I I want to go for the real as opposed to the uh, the uh, uh, fantasizing about the the, the possibilities. Um, maybe you're asking about, I mean, are governments for better government? Are, are, are libertarians for better government? I mean, uh, I see, I even see bumper stickers occasionally, you know, I'm, I'm for good government or whatever it says. And of course, that's, that's not what libertarians are for at all. Is that the kind of thing you're, you're discussing? I thought that. I thought that's what you were going to. Um, certainly, we should take every advantage to predict the the, the mess that government is going to make of everything, and that that has powerful uh, can have powerful results when you can say, you know, we've been saying this all along. You know, look at the record; um, we we've been right about this all along. But as for hoping for that to happen, well, I'm, I guess I'm not for that. We're not only for better government, we're for the best government. <laughs> uh, on, the, uh, on the worse is better argument, uh, the reply that I made to that a long time ago uh, was that you can see that this principle works, that if you make government bad enough, you get a free society, by looking at the uh, libertarian anarchist societies which now exist where Hitler and Stalin once ruled. Uh, but I, I should say, though, that there certainly are some specific cases where making government, say, if you have a change which makes government no less oppressive but somewhat less noticeable, that probably is an undesirable change. So that, for example, I would be in favor of repealing the withholding tax on the grounds that the withholding tax doesn't make government you know, substantially cheaper or more efficient, but it does make it somewhat less obtrusive and therefore makes people less, available, less aware of what they're paying. So there certainly are a few cases where you should make it a little bit worse to, so you'll get some friction. But as a general rule, my, my inclination is that you want it to do as little damage as possible. I tend to agree with both the other speakers. I think there are specific cases. For instance, I remember back in 79, the discussion of bringing back the draft, right at the time that uh, SLS was starting to try to build a libertarian student movement. If they had brought back the draft, it probably would have been easier to build opposition in general on campuses. Now, whether we would have then been in a position to create more libertarians on campus is a question that was basically up to us to answer. But in the short run like that, it would have. Still, I don't think we should hope for that sort of thing. Um, I think we should be prepared to take advantage of it if it happens. There is a, a slightly different question, though, and that deals with making government more efficient, um, privatization, and that sort of thing. And I think in, in many cases, those are not good ideas. We don't want to make government more efficient. We don't want OSHA to learn how to be more productive. Um, we don't want the Drug Enforcement Administration to get more work out of its employees. And uh, <laughs> to the extent that somebody can suggest to government a new computer system that would make it more efficient, uh, that sort of thing, I think that's a bad idea. 
I think that's different from a tax. Yes, if we could cut taxes in half like the Clark campaign proposed, say we'd gotten elected, say we implemented that, well, that probably would have taken the steam out of the tax revolt for a while. But uh, everybody would have had half their tax money back. So I don't think you can oppose that, even though you recognize some drawbacks. I just, I just wanted to comment on the question of making government more efficient. I think there it's very much a question of which thing government is doing. Some of the things that government is doing are things that should be done, although not by government. So if you make government post office more efficient, it seems to me that's an unambiguous benefit, even though it may slightly slow down abolishing the government post office. If you make the government drug enforcement more efficient, that's an unambiguous loss because they're doing an undesirable thing. Unless, of course, they just cut the number of people they hire proportionally and then you save some money. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. I've always believed that altruism is the denial of the importance of the individual and putting the importance of the masses in pay, you know, as a more important idea. Um, just last summer, I read Money Peacock's Thomas Parallels, and I've come to the conclusion that one of the most disturbing values among most Americans is that people are quite altruistic and that they do not believe that the individual is important and that the masses are. Lady at a uh, county fair that I was working at told me uh, Sunday night that liberty must always be circumscribed for the good of the whole of society. <laughs> now, I'm confused because I always thought the libertarians were for liberty and altruism does not equal liberty, as far as I'm concerned. I would say that altruism neither is liberty nor is inconsistent with liberty, that it's a second uh, value which might or may not be consistent. Uh, I would not say that altruism is the masses versus the individual. I would say that altruism would be saying that other people are an important value for me. And if I am extremely altruistic, I might say that other people are even more important for me than I am. If I am mildly altruistic, I would say, well, I'm more important for me, but nonetheless, the other people are pretty valuable too. And so if, at a small cost to me, I can produce a large benefit for you, I will do so. That's what I would say that the word altruism means. It comes from the Latin word for other, uh, I believe. But, but I would say, it seems to me, since I believe that a libertarian society would be best for pretty nearly everybody, that if I were quite an extreme altruist, and the main thing I wanted was to make everybody else in the world happy, I would be a libertarian because a libertarian society would make people in general happier. If I am a selfish individualist, uh, if I'm a selfish individualist, similarly, since I then want to make myself happy and I'm one of the people who will be made happier by a libertarian society, I'm still in favor of a libertarian society. So that if, if the only question is how large a weight in my objectors does other people's welfare have, I don't think that much affects whether or not I'm an altruist. I mean, sorry, whether or not I'm a libertarian. contradiction between altruism and liberty, or libertarianism. Take the case of a woman who decides to enter a convent and spend the rest of her life working to help other people, whether it is educating children, ministering to the poor in Africa, or whatever. She is not doing anything unlibertarian. She probably gets a positive benefit out of uh, knowing that she is helping other people's lives to be better. But she is certainly an altruist, and yet she's not doing anything unlibertarian. Dorothy Day, I think, would certainly be considered an altruist, the woman who uh, set up soup kitchens, yet she was a Catholic anarchist. Um, she hated the government. She wanted to abolish the government, but she spent her entire life working for virtually no wages, um, helping other people. As far as that goes, why are you all here? Surely you all had something better to do. Um, you spent a lot of money to come here. Most of you spend a lot of money year in and year out and a lot of time going to meetings that are generally not very interesting in my uh, experience. <laughs> I spend full time um, working for liberty. Is that because I think in the end I'll be better off? Frankly, although I'm optimistic that we can achieve freedom in my lifetime, I doubt I'll be all that young um, <laughs> to be able to enjoy it. Um, I know I could be making more money right now doing something else, have more time for travel and all of those sorts of things. Is that a form of altruism? Um, I'm doing it because I think it's right. It's just. What they do to people in this society, what governments do to people is wrong. And that makes me mad and I want to stop it. 
And uh, it's not just because of what they do to me. I tend to be a pretty middle-class person. Um, I don't want to use drugs. Um, I don't want to do a lot of the things. I never get hassled by the cops, um, which is probably a flaw in my own makeup. Uh, I would like to spend all of my own money, but on the other hand, I could go get another job, make more money, and have just as much take-home pay as I would if I got all of this money without the taxes being taken out of it. I guess that's a form of altruism. I hate what the government does to people, and I want to stop it for all of them. Uh, just to keep this brief, I think that the, the whole issue here is over the definition of the word altruism. I think you really hit, hit what's really the problem is not altruism, but the idea that liberty must be circumscribed somehow for the, the good of the whole. And that's, as we know, simply a mistaken idea, and that's what we've got to kind of go after. Anything else that I might say would just be agreeing with the other speakers, and we've done that too much as it is. That's right. I'd like to see hands for questions that are likely to cause arguments. <laughs> to uh, limit the rates on a privately held corporation, albeit a government franchise one, is it ethical to uh, support that rate limitation on a private corporation? This is a private monopoly, government franchise monopoly. I lost track. Oh, yes, okay, there it goes. Um, I don't think a private monopoly for an essential service is a private company. Um, and I think that, uh, I'm, I'm not saying libertarians ought to go out and be in the forefront of the effort to limit its rates, but I don't think it's a private company. Um, it's barely more private than the post office. I mean, technically that's the U.S. Postal Service, and although it gets some money from government, it's not a government agency. Um, I don't think a franchise monopoly is very different, and so I don't see anything basically unlibertarian about opposing its rate increases, um, well, you should argue for deregulation. You should use that opportunity to bring up the issue and say, if there was competition, um, we'd be able to get better service and probably lower rates. Um, but I don't think, uh, I, I would say that's not something I'd pick as an issue to go out and lead the campaign to stop the phone company's horrendous new rate increases. Um, but I don't think you're talking about really regulating a private company in the sense we know it. I, um, I guess I agree with, I think it's Milton Friedman who says, better a private monopoly than a government monopoly. Um, uh, though I would be hard pressed to, to enumerate all his, all his reasons. I liked it at the time when I read it. If I had to vote uh, in such a case, if I were a state legislator, I guess I would vote against the price the price ceiling, and I would try to use the occasion as an opportunity to bring up the whole issue of should there be a monopoly uh, altogether. Um, I guess um, hmm. I guess I'd really like to think about it more. I hope I wouldn't be be placed in that position. <laughs> I think I agree with both people that my initial reaction is that if such an issue comes up, you should say what we are in favor of is abolishing the protection against competition. Uh, that's what we want. That will take care of the problem of prices. I should say in, in my father's defense, I believe what he said was that he preferred a private monopoly in the sense of a natural monopoly. That is a single firm with no law against other firms coming in to a government monopoly. Uh, I don't think that the question involved a private monopoly in the sense of a franchise where it's illegal for other firms to come in. Uh, but in any case, as I say, my inclination is that you shouldn't have libertarians campaigning for price ceilings because that gets people confused. You should have libertarians campaigning for abolishing monopoly privileges. Okay, I think we'll take one more question and then I'll ask the panelists <clears throat> after they've answered that question to, uh, to summarize and... Uh, will be finished. Um, yes.
there were no rules um, uh, or no laws or no uh, heavy hand of the state would come down for a libertarian official raising money uh, uh, you know, from libertarians or from whoever to avoid taking the government money, then I'd say we should take that route. We should try to um, um, provide the money on the side, let them turn back the salary or give it back to taxpayers or something. Unfortunately, boy, in the real world, that would be, uh, that would be buying a politician and they're just not going to not going to, the, the government is not going to stand for that. Um, so if it means that all we can have running for candidates, uh, running, running, the only candidates we can have running for office and winning are those who are millionaires and can support themselves without working. Well, that's the ones anyway. <laughs> <laughs> not so sure. Um, then, uh, then I'd say better to have uh, an elected libertarian who's doing the right things, taking the salary and doing doing the, the job there in um, Washington or whatever, which, by the way, I think is not just voting on the, on the issues the right way. It's using that as a platform to which to uh, talk to the, to, to the masses about the broader issues. Um, then I'd say go ahead and take the salary. One of the other things I believe in as an economist is the principle of revealed preference. And since I have it several times in the past taken salaries that ultimately came from governments, I can't really claim that I am object in principle to taking salaries from governments. Now, it might be a useful publicity device to try to give the money back or whatever. Uh, two minor comments uh, on, on what Scott said. First, unless they've changed the law recently, it is legal to give money to subsidize politicians. The way you do it is you give the money to subsidize their campaigns, and unless they've changed the law, the politician is legally able to pocket what is left from his campaign after the election is over. Now, maybe they've plugged that loophole, but that you was... You know, no libertarian would ever have any money left. That was... <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was recently true. Also, an alternative to being a millionaire is being an ascetic. Uh, it is possible... <laughs> It is possible to live on a very low amount of money, although it may not be much fun. Washington? <laughs> Even in Washington. Yeah. And that leads us into David. Did you, did you start? I didn't start. Um, I, I basically agree with the two previous speakers. I think that, uh, especially given my earlier uh, acceptance of the idea of uh, appointed government uh, employees taking salaries, um, and my general perspective that that doesn't change the overall level of taxation. Um, the, the question of whether you would get more bang for the buck by turning it down is a strategic question. Uh, if you were getting any significant number of people elected, I don't think you would because uh, you'd have people who weren't able to serve. They would be resigning um, because they couldn't afford to be in office. Um, as far as the ethical question, I'd feel uncomfortable if it were me, um, but I wouldn't say it's wrong if you are trying to do something for liberty and you have to take your salary. Uh, actually, it appears we, we will have time for one more. That one was kind of short. So, uh, so I'm glad to ask. Yes. Is it possible, do you think it's how to go about trying to write a government, apply for a government grant for the purpose of eliminating coercion when the funds that you are applying for are gotten coercively? <laughs> oddly enough, uh, <laughs> oddly enough, my application to the National Science Foundation to fund my research on whether governments spent money because they needed it or because they had it uh, was rejected. Uh, <laughs> And that research got uh, privately funded. Uh, on the other hand, I suspect, given the way the granting proposal, uh, pr the granting procedure goes, that it would be conceivable. I mean, I think they don't sort of have a clever expert person going over each one saying, is this ultimately anti-government? So <laughs> if you could dress up your research proposal sufficiently well in the jargon of your own field, and if you had a good enough vita to show you were a good person to subsidize, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if it were possible to get uh, research proposals through the NSF, which in fact aimed at abolishing the NSF for taxes or practically anything else. But I didn't manage it. <laughs> I tried. I work for a, a public policy institute. Most public policy institutions, well, at least a lot of them, do take government money. Um, 
we've always maintained that we would not. We haven't been offered any. Um, <laughs> but I don't know that we couldn't get it if we asked. Um, one of the problems there, of course, is strategic from our own perspective. There are a lot of strings attached to government money. Um, it's a reporting hassle and everything. Um, it limits what you can do. Um, it, it simply creates a lot of problems. I would be... Um, I would be inclined against asking for government grants for that sort of thing. Um, it's sort of, I don't know, I guess I feel one, it's one thing to take a job that exists, being a city councilman or a congressman, um, and accepting the salary that comes with it, and a different thing to ask for one. Um, it's something like a corporation. Should a corporation ask for a government subsidy if the subsidy program already exists? Um, I think it probably shouldn't, but on the other hand, if all of its competitors are being subsidized um, and the program already exists, I'm not sure I can say that it's definitely wrong. Um, I think it tends to create more demand for government in that case, and the same thing would be true with the grants. So I, I would be uncomfortable with asking for a government grant even for such a noble purpose. I, I guess I don't see how, how you can consistently be against coercion and collect uh, the government grant. Um, on the other side of this, just to be wishy-washy again for a minute, um, when, when this first came up, uh, uh, to me, I was a graduate student in a department where most of the funds are government funds. Now, it so happened at the time that uh, the research program I was in was not funded by government, um, but we're always looking for new money, you know, uh, uh, and so someone said, well, isn't it applying for government grant and getting the money, just getting back money that's been stolen from you, assuming that you've been a taxpayer and paid, paid it out, or assuming that you're going to be a taxpayer and you will pay it out at some point, uh, maybe you can get it back first and then pay it back later. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm attracted by that argument a little bit, but not enough to, uh, to actually do it. I've got to announce something. Film Amicus in America was funded <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which party the joke was on, the National Endowment or Pacific Street Films who made it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Uh, we'll now uh, have each of the panelists uh, sum up uh, for uh, the next few minutes, and we'll begin with uh, David Bowes, and then we'll go with uh, Scott Olmsted, and then uh, finish with David Friedman. And... Uh, Well, I don't have a lot to say except uh, what I opened with, I guess. I think we should be careful to define our terms, and it seems to me as a libertarian movement advancing the libertarian philosophy, our definition of an unethical action or an unethical strategy ought to be, does it violate someone else's rights? Um, other strategies I may refuse to engage in because I think they are unethical, but I don't think I would make that a stricture for the libertarian movement. Most of the ones that I would refuse to engage in because of their non-rights violating ethics problems would probably present strategic problems too. Um, but I think when any course of action or any strategy is proposed, the first question is, does it violate rights? Um, almost all strategies that I've, I've heard proposed for libertarians do not violate rights. So in that case, the question becomes, does it seem the most likely to help us move to a free society? And that ought to be the question that is uppermost in our minds. Once we've satisfied ourselves, it doesn't violate rights. Well, I think it's inter interesting today what we have not discussed at all, which is uh, uh, the conflict which has occupied a lot of the libertarian press recently, is, is, and that is, is it ethical to vote? Is it ethical to run for office? Is that all right? Uh, are there other things uh, that we do as we... Uh, engaging in the political process that are simply unlibertarian, none of this stuff has come up today. We've concentrated mostly on uh, the extreme things, on some of the nitpicky things about taking salaries and whatnot. Um, uh, I, I'm continuously uh, amused at the uh, people who think that to be a true libertarian and to really um, uh, do the whole thing ethically, you have to live liberty, okay? You have to be sort of a guerrilla street fighter and uh, you know, not use the post office, not like stamps or whatever it is. Um, it seems to me like, like uh, if you do that, you're treating the, the symptoms rather than attacking the disease. And I'm really pleased to, to see that there are uh, substantial numbers of people still in the party who really want to attack the disease of government rather than just treat the symptoms.
My complaint about this panel is it's been far too much of a love fest with all of us agreeing with each other. Uh, so I'd like to leave you with thinking about the problems that I regard as sort of difficult and unpleasant problems. And those are problems such as uh, you are elected governor or president. Uh, it is perfectly clear that the uh, voters are not ready for anything like the abolition of, of all taxes. Uh, what do you do when the first person who refuses to pay taxes comes to you asking for a pardon? That is to say, uh, imagine the situation, which I think is not an implausible one. If you pardon all people who refuse to pay taxes, the Libertarian Party will never win another election because the voters will say, look, we didn't elect you to abolish taxes. We elected you to cut them by 23%. Uh, on the other hand, if you refuse to pardon him, are you not, in effect, yourself a coercer? Another version of the same problem, and one which I believe is a real problem, though a lot of people here don't, is suppose you conclude when you get elected president that at the moment there is no way of defending against foreign states except with stolen money, that is, except with tax money. Uh, do you or don't you continue to enforce the IRS code? In other words, suppose you could abolish the taxes, Suppose you believe that abolishing the taxes would result in a Soviet takeover within the next three years. Uh, do you or don't you abolish them? And again, you seem to be stuck in this situation where, on the one hand, uh, it's immoral to steal money, and on the other hand, uh, you get catastrophic results if you don't. So I'd like all of you to think about those problems and to make up your mind as to what you would do, and maybe to be a little more tolerant with people who disagree with you thereafter, i.e. I think if you really imagine really being faced with that situation, you will then be less willing to say, he says under some circumstance that we should have taxes, therefore he's not a libertarian. Because most of you, the reason you disagree is you don't imagine the hard problem, not you disagree with the answer. Thank you. I'd ask that you give all the participants a nice round of applause.